to Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Brittany Zimmerman. I'm Richard Hall, your co-host. And joining us today is our guest, the Fire Chief, Kazuo Todd, who will help us do a deep dive into our F conversation. So this week's F letter is Firefighting Solution. Welcome, Kazuo. How are you doing? I'm oh, doing pretty good. Thank you for inviting me on the show. We're really excited to have you. And of course, I think this is a topic that is extremely appropriate, right, for where we're sitting today in the state of Hawaii. And after seeing a lot of the recent things that have gone on, both on the big island uh, and on our neighboring island, um, I think there's a lot of questions around this. So it's uh, particularly of interest. And Richard, how are you doing? Oh, pretty top shape. Yep. I can't wait to ask a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> All right. You want to start it off? You want to kick off the questions, Richard? Yeah. You know what? What's on my mind is this. You know, uh, Chief, what, um, what would you recommend for rural um, houses? If, if you had, you know, you, you could suggest what homeowners could do to protect themselves from fires that's coming from the outside, coming toward the house, stuff like that. What what generally general strategy would you suggest? You know, um, one of the best things that's out there uh, for homeowners is our our Firewise programs. And um, Firewise was an initiative to deal with wildland uh, urban interfaces in terms of you know there's a brush fire and the fire is coming. And it comes up to the edge of your house because, you know, your house is maybe backing um, some brush or a field or even a forest or things like that. And so Firewise looked at like, well, how do, you know, houses survive fires? And what were the characteristics of a house that, you know, the fire came through the area and the house was still still there after? Um, if you guys are watching all the stuff going in Maui, they talk about, you know, the, the miracle house in Lahaina and everything else. And, and one of the things that was, you know, maybe a little different than that house than some of the others was just the fact that it had a nice green space around the house uh, and that there weren't any plants that were directly against the house that allowed the, the fire to transition into the house. Um, and so there definitely are things that, you know, us as the general public can do for our personal homes. You know, we can make sure that we have a, a good barrier around our house in terms of a green space between our house and things that are combustible. We can keep things that are combustible away from the sides of the homes. We can make sure that um, entrances at the sockets uh, of our house aren't open, that will allow embers to come inside and start a fire internally. And so there's some different things in there, but um, the best thing to remember would be FireWise. Uh, and if you do a Google search for FireWise, it brings up a whole host of information about you know, the different steps you can take from choosing what kind of plants are in your yard, to maintaining, you know, that green space around, to reducing combustibles and fuels and things like that. And they're just as useful for if your neighbor's house catches on fire as it is for, you know, if there is one of these uh, wildland fires that's coming through the area. Hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So how many fire stations do we have on the Big Island? So currently on the Big Island of Hawaii, we have a total of 20 paid fire stations and 18 volunteer fire stations. Um, Hawaii County is the only county in the state of Hawaii right now that is a combination system in that we have both volunteers and we have paid personnel. And uh, we have a mixture of stations between the two. Um, generally, a station is either paid or volunteer. It's, it's not like we have stations where we're mixing our, our people. Um, but... Uh, the history of the volunteer side for our department actually stretches back to our founding. In 1888, the Kilo Volunteer Fire Department was formed. And uh, for the first uh, 36 years or so, um, there were no paid firefighters in the county of Hawaii. Somewhere around 1922 to 1924, the first paid fire chief and firefighters um, were basically enacted. And um, that was Fire Chief William Todd, uh, and uh, not related to me, but uh, he was the first paid fire chief for our department, and he took over. And at that time, they had seven employees uh, for the whole island, basically. But uh, over the years, we've expanded, and we had more and more paid personnel. But unlike the other islands that eventually did away with their volunteers, 
because of the geographic size of the Big Island and our need to just respond to so many places and such a large um, response area, we've maintained those volunteers over the years. So we've actually, you know, almost 130 years of um, volunteers on our island, if I'm doing the math correctly, and another, you know, 100 or so years of um, regular uh, firefighters on the island that are paid. So a mixture of the two. That's wild. And are the volunteers people who just know a lot about firefighting? Are they passed? Are they certified in some way? Like if you get to pick between having like a paid, you know, county employee versus a volunteer in terms of their expertise and their abilities, or are they approximately similar? That is interesting in that the, there's a wide disparity um, in, in both directions. Um, I have, you know, some volunteer personnel have been volunteering with us for decades and are extremely knowledgeable and extremely um, capable in terms of, you know, attacking fire and, and just having spent so much time with us. I also have some people that decided to volunteer yesterday and are, you know, basically very, very new and, and lacking in experience. Um, the plus with our paid personnel is that the training is exactly the same, right? Uh, we've been training them for, for, you know, decades, basically in the same classroom and the same you know, curriculum, newer books, newer techniques sometimes, but generally, you know, when a firefighter gets hired by the County of Hawaii and becomes a paid firefighter, the training they have and the training that, you know, uh, our firefighters for the last, you know, couple of decades have gone through is basically the same, you know? And so with the paid personnel, you know exactly what you're going to get. With our volunteers, you can get the whole range. You have some people that are amazingly, uh, you know, experienced in what they're doing and have a great deal yeah. of expertise. And you also have some very, very new people um, that have just decided to volunteer. Um, and, you know, that training can take a long time before they get to that because of the, the fact that it is a volunteer side of things. What does a firefighter training look like? Well, uh, it's about a year long in the county of Hawaii. So in addition to being the only county that is a volunteer and paid combination department system, we're mm -hmm. also the only county that is a combined EMS and fire system. So currently we receive a budget from the state to manage our um, ambulance responses on the uh, island. And so we have 16 ALS ambulances or uh, advanced life support ambulances, which have paramedics as well as an EMT on top. And so those personnel are also trained to be firefighters. But when we talk about training, um, personnel that get hired by the Hawaii County Fire Department are expected to not only go through training to become firefighters, they're also expected to go through training and become uh, EMTs at the bare minimum. Um, we also don't mind if they become paramedics, but Essentially, the, bare, the the basic requirement is that anyone who goes through our training, which takes a year, it's about half of that time is going to be to become a firefighter under a pro board certification. And about half of that time is going to be becoming a EMT under state licensure. So they have to get um, their state license to be an EMTB in the state of Hawaii and be able to practice on an ambulance. And so uh, their certification allows them to drive ambulances and uh, help out with those issues. As for the training itself, um, it's a pretty grueling year. Uh, we tell our personnel to, um, you know, hug and kiss their family members goodbye, and that we'll return them in a year or so. Um, but please do all their laundry for them because they're gonna, gonna work out all day long, and then they're gonna go home and study all night, and then they're gonna go to sleep. And you'll maybe get to talk to them on weekends um, because that's pretty intensive. Um, we only allow them to fail a certain number of tests, and then they're released. They can you know, essentially fail a test once and they got to pass a remake. And if they fail either the remake or they fail too many tests in a row or just in total, um, they're released and they lose their job. So we expect uh, very high levels of um, performance from our personnel because the public expects a lot out of us. Yeah. And so that training is inclusive of, you know, learning how to do ladder operations, to hold a nozzle, to walking into burning buildings and to understanding flame uh, flames inside buildings and fire dynamics <clears throat> to understanding path flow and ventilation uh, on the fire side and on the EMS uh, side they're expected to learn how to do IVs and read EKGs and administer drugs and uh, do minor things like how to wrap wounds or things like that as well and then we also spend a variety of time uh, learning how to drive vehicles because emergency vehicles have lights and sirens and that affects people around you and so defensive driving is also an aspect in that and then we also do a water week 
because we expect them to basically kind of be a lifeguard as well. So they, they wow. spend a week in the water. We have a water week training. Uh, and uh, they will spend eight hours in the water a day for five days in a row. Oh, oh my gosh, that's a pretty intense. And once you get through that, are there like refreshers? Is there stuff that people have to do? Like, are there retesting? What is it? What does it look like throughout the career? Your whole career is training. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, so uh, oh, I, I visit my stations on a pretty regular basis. And one of the things the guys complain about is, Jeff. I'm so tired of all this online training. Uh, we went to a lot of online training during COVID, um, but we do a lot of training. Um, you know, there's there's time, right, between calls. Mm -hmm. And if, um, you know, there isn't a call going on right now, it's an opportunity to train um, mm -hmm. and exercise. You know, uh, one of the things some guys say they like about being a firefighter is they're, they're paid to work out, but they are paid to work out because, you know, um, when stuff's going wrong and, you know, Maui, this island, wherever, you want kind of one of those big, strong people, male, female, doesn't matter to us, but you want someone who's physically fit to be able to come in there and handle stuff. And so we pay him to work out, we pay him to exercise, we pay him to train. Um, and uh, yeah, like, uh, you know, a couple of decades in for myself and I, myself as the fire chief, I'm still doing training on a very, very regular basis. Um, it's less of the stuff that my firefighters go through in terms of fire dynamics and, you know, refreshers on how to use the hose or the line or things like that, and more about how to be a good fire chief. But um, from the very top of the organization to the very bottom, the training never really ends. I, I could tell you're in good shape. You know why? Because the several times we were around you, man, you can eat. So I know you're using a lot of energy. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. Um, definitely being a fire chief has not been the greatest thing for my waistline. I, uh, you know, in my old position, uh, I, I used to run as a battalion chief and ran the warehouse. And one of the things I liked the best about it was, you know, two days a week or so, I I'd take off the shirt and uh, go throw boxes in the warehouse. And so it was my way of getting some good exercise, lifting, you know, heavy boxes and throwing stuff in the dumpster to get it out of the warehouse that once it was too old or whatever and moving holes and checking stuff. And it felt like, you know, still being a firefighter, but, um, you know, getting some really important work done for the department. And uh, as a chief, oh, my job is, is mostly nowadays just meetings and um, going to do emails and stuff like that. I've somehow become a professional email writer and meeting attender. Um, but, you know, it is necessary. And, um, you know, I, I try to diet and maintain uh, some some shape. It's currently pear shape, but you know, we're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I have one question. You know, and EMT. What does EMT stand for? Uh, emergency medical technician. I uh, got you. Got you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And I was thinking, what is what is a typical response time? Right. I mean, I've never been in a fire where I've had to call and you know ask for help but here on the big island um i imagine it's probably pretty different depending on where you are but what, what kind of a range are we talking about in terms of uh responsiveness so you know it, it varies throughout the united states really dependent on you know whether it's super urban or super rural on mm -hmm. the big island we generally have a response time between eight and ten minutes and you know that isn't particularly great, you know, and, and generally in cities, you're looking for that four to five minute response time as an ideal. But mm -hmm. the reality is, is that we've decided to really spread our population out over the entire island. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> that response time is an average, right? You, you have places in town where our personnel are on scene in just a couple minutes. Yeah. You have places that are out in the countryside a little bit farther away and you know, it can be half an hour before we get there because you, you know, a lot of people have decided that they don't really want to live next to other people. They like that privacy. They like that seclusion. And our island offers that ability because we've decided to basically, you know, cut it apart and make lots all over the place. But one of the problems with that is, is that, um, you know, as you move away from society, uh, society's ability to respond to you on a timely basis is, is lengthened a little bit. So if you're way up that dirt road and there's no water supply and then there's a fire and you're expecting us to come in there and, and have that same level of, of service it is a little difficult because 
you know, there's no hydrants and there's no water and things like that. We're having to truck water in and we do our best with it. But yeah, definitely um, the Big Island is more rural than it is urban. And, and so we don't see that same kind of um, responses. No, when we look at like the state as a whole, um, you know, if you look at like Maui, they, you know, they have a total of 14 stations. Um, you know, Honolulu has like a 44 stations and then like Hawaii is running like 10 I believe, right now. I think they're going up to 11. But they're, the size of their islands and the size of their response areas is much smaller. And if you look at our island, we're running 38 stations, which is almost as many as Honolulu. But mm -hmm. even so, our island is literally half the landmass of the state. So when you start thinking about it from that perspective, those stations are really spread out. Um, and that doesn't allow us for great response time. Um, but, yeah, we do the best we can and we'll, we'll be there as soon as we possibly can. So call early it would be basically what I'd say. <laughs> Mm. For sure. And how many people traditionally need to be at a fire, right? I mean, how many firemen are, are needing to show up for just like a traditional home fire? So under the National Fire Protection Association's code 1710, um, which is the NFPA 1710, it's recommended that there be 16 firefighters on a single residential structure fire. Um, once you run to like a strip mall that goes up to 28, and then if you're doing a high rise, they're talking about 42 firefighters to fight a high rise. Mm -hmm. uh, a large chunk of those guys on the high rise are carrying breathing bottles upstairs too. Um, the guys at the top that are actually fighting the fire um, because they're out of breath by the time they get to the top mm -hmm. of the you know, 7th, 10th, 20th story yeah. uh, running up mm -hmm. the stairs, right? Um, but uh, it all varies on what a jurisdiction is able to supply. Uh, I can tell you on our island, having 16 firefighters on a single fire, at least initially within the recommendations of, you know, 1710, is almost impossible. Um, yeah. Because our, our first station will probably be there within that 8 to 10 minutes range. But the next station away might be 20 minutes, might be 30 minutes away before it gets there. And so that first station is only going to come with anywhere from four to six personnel. Mm -hmm. um, and so by the time... And depending on where you are in the country, we might only have like, two other stations respond, in which case they bring maybe another three to four people and another three to four. And so many places on the island, we'd never hit 16 personnel, um, at least on our paid side. Um, yeah. Luckily, we do have a, a, a wonderful volunteer side and they'll come and assist. Um, our, currently, our volunteers are not cleared for internal structural firefighting. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't have them in the appropriate um, compliant gear and we haven't tested them for SCBAs. But they are able to assist in the external areas of the fire in terms of water supply or um, trucking water in or helping us hook up or do an external protection. So there's mm -hmm. some uh, benefit to that, but it's not the same. Um, and so there's pluses and, and you know minuses in our current system. Yeah, and you brought up water supply, and that's an interesting thing to think about here because, like, I know in town I've seen some fire hydrants, but in the majority of places I visited, I don't think there is fire hydrants everywhere <laughs> about one third of our island is actually um with a water system and mm. approximately two thirds of the island is running off of catchment or some other means of uh water for residences and as a result of that uh the ability for the fire department to be able to hook in and get water to fight a fire is sometimes limited uh, it's one of the reasons you know helicopters are so important for fire operations and, and whatnot mm -hmm. is that, you know, oftentimes we're out in the middle of nowhere and the process of, you know, filling up a truck full of water, driving into an incident and then dumping it and then coming back, you know, we could be talking a half hour, 45 minute loop. By the time yeah. you get back with more water, the fire is back to where it was, right? Um, yeah. And I, I've actually fought fires down in Ocean View when I was working down there because that's all catchment and everything else. And the nearest hydrant was the, uh, down in Waipino. Um, where, you know, we'd go, we'd fight the fire, knock it down, pretty much put it out, and then we'd go have to get water. And then by the time we're back, mm -hmm. the house is on fire again. And so it was this wow. cycle of almost put out the fire, and then we were out of water, right? So we'll get some more water, come back, house is on fire again. And, you know, mm -hmm. we just not enough water, and the, the, the route to go back and come back with more water took too long. So, uh, you know, one of the things we've worked on over the last, you know, decade and a half or so is to bring in more water tankers and more uh, mobile water supply to, you know, meet those needs. But uh, 
it's a constant struggle to, to try to figure out what would be best serving this community and, and how do we staff that and how do we get personnel and, and vehicles and how do we maintain those vehicles and replace them when it comes time. Right. It seems to me that uh, there's a lot more um, brush fires like that on the corner side, wherever it's dry. It, um, it, in general, that's kind of how you you see that. Or And, and the, what I'm getting at is, is there sometime in the future, there's going to be a time when it gets so dry that all of the green stuff that we have here on the Hilo side might be a problem? Or do, do you folks kind of think that through to anticipate? You know, uh, nothing is out of the possible realm, right? Um, we could have massive brush fires in Hilo if we had a drought long enough. Uh, in my life, I, I have yet to see Hilo that dry. Uh, Hilo is is up there in the rainiest places in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. I'm worried more about probably Hamakua, um, Ka'u, and our... Um, the greater Kauai High, you know, um, South Wahala region, um, Waikoloa and stuff like that. So <clears throat> every year we're, we're running into fires in the Waikoloa, you know, um, Kauai High region. Um, and that's just pretty normal. Uh, the grass grows and something starts a fire and it just rips through the area. Mm -hmm. And it's a pretty consistent thing. One of the nice things is, is because it's consistent over the years, we've added uh you know, a decent amount of fire protection. We have a very robust volunteer groups out there because they're getting a lot of time on the on the line, and so they're active, and and so we have a good um, response for that area. The other area that we also get a large response is in the Kau area, uh, mm -hmm. and part of that is um, it actually dries out more than you'd think in in you know the Pahala Nalehu areas, and and we do end up with brush fires down there, and uh, so we can get you know longer responses. It's not quite as active as our fires out in the white lower region in terms of number of fires and everything else. But equally, you know, um, things are going out uh, down in Kukul. Um, the one other area that does concern me a little bit is in the Hamakua region. Hmm. So uh, historically, you know, a lot of sugarcane in that area. And we've um, moved forward with the planting of a lot of uh, eucalyptus out there. Hmm. Uh, right now, the eucalyptus keeps the undergrowth from growing too much. But I don't know that there's a really good plan for long-term management of the land. And um, right now, they're not really harvesting the trees for any particular purpose, which means, you know, um, one, we have the potential for a forest fire someday. If um, we ran into some drought conditions and the fire was able to extend into the um, crowns of, of the trees. And then the other thing, too, is, you know, at, at some point, maybe they do cut down the trees, in which case, you know, we're looking at um, that grass because it's on the wetter side, um, the growth that we can see there is far, far greater than what you'll see in Waikoloa. So Waikoloa, usually the scrub gets to about two feet, but we've seen growth on like the Hamakua side where the grass can get up to 10, 12, mm. you know, 15 feet yeah. tall. Yeah. Um, you know, there's California grass and stuff like that. And then if you combine that with a really nice drought and then that catches, oh, man, that could be a really, really large fire on the Hamakua side. That would be very, very difficult for us to do much about. Um, based on our current resources and stuff. So those are the areas that are of primary concern to me as the fire chief and, and you know, considering long-term applicability of our resources and how do we get there to solve those issues if they do become one some days, you know, part of the time I spend each day to, you know, talk with my um, up chain in terms of the, the mayor and, and the staff and the county council about like, well, hey, you know, this is the possible problem and this is what we would need to solve it. And, you know, advocating for money and funding and more positions, and obviously, and try and deal with that in the future. You know what? What could the average citizen do? You know, like when when there's ambulances coming, so you hear it, and uh, is it your sense that the people are respect? I mean, are reacting in the proper way, or could they react better? Or do you have any comments about that? You know, uh, as far as pulling over and allowing our ambulances to transit to the hospital, um, I have not noticed any issues. Um, generally, the, the general reminder, you always have one or two people that are using this as an opportunity to go a little faster and get out of the way, um, <laughs> you know, or whatever. But most people, um, you know, they, they're, they're living with Aloha, right? So they, they, they take care, they do the right thing. Um, they pull over when, you know, emergency services are coming through and, and make way and then they're safe. 
there, there's exceptions, but that, that's more of an exception than than the normal. So I, you know, I I think our people are amazing, and we do a good job of maintaining um, good public order, and you know, the public is is very supportive. So not something I usually worry about. Well, that's good to hear. And I know through a lot of the media recently, right? We've all, everybody's reached out a lot um, with the news of everything that happened on Maui. I don't think we've talked as much about what had happened on the Big Island, kind of in that same stretch. Will you fill some of us in on, you know, what was going on on this island? You know, um, it was a pretty impressive day in terms of fire uh, and how quickly it grew. And and uh, for my personnel out in the scene, they they were discussing how it was unlike anything they'd ever seen. You know, a few years ago we had Mono Road and we burned forty thousand acres. And the high winds had generated, you know, 50 foot flame fronts off of, you know, just two feet of um, grass, which was unheard of, you know, at that time. Um, and pretty scary, uh, you know, when you look up at the horizon and, and literally from, you know, mountain to mountain, you can see pretty much everything burning. Um, this one, the winds were even more excessive and, and, you know, the confusion and the inability to see was was, was interesting. Uh, our personnel we're saying any, anyone who was weighing less than like 150 pounds was having to hold on to the fire truck at some times because of how hard the wind was blowing so they didn't get blown away. Um, and, you know, we're having issues where, you know, you're pumping water, but the water streams were just turning around and going back in the other direction because of the, the winds, right? So the ability to apply water was difficult too. Um, my personnel did an amazing job. Uh, we had about six or seven structures that, you know, we had direct flame impingement on and we were able to go in stop the fire from spreading and save the structures. We had a warehouse out in the um, Mauna Kea Beach area that uh, caught fire and we let it go because there was not a not a residence. So uh, we, we triaged it and let it burn um, to save other residential structures. And um, for the most part, we, we did an amazing job. We lost, no, one, no one's house was lost. Um, we did sustain damage, but we were able to present or, or preserve all residential homes in the, uh, Pahala, Kauai High, um, Mauna Kea region. So uh, definitely, you know, my personnel, I, I, I got to, you know, give my hat off to, for their, their performance out there, worked excessively hard. Uh, it was touch and go. We had to ground our own helicopters because of the, how heavy the winds are, but um, oh. you know, not to, to take away from Maui, who had, you know, an exceptionally hard um, situation in front of them um you know i am very pleased with my own personnel and, and their actions out there got you and did maui contact you at all did maui need to pull resources from any of the other islands in terms of fire personnel maui right now i'll be going over this weekend to go sit in their eoc and actually uh talk with them mm -hmm. and uh see what kind of needs they have and everything else and some of my personnel have responded responded on their own time as for fire personnel, one of the bigger issues is um, vehicles, right? So, like, even if I sent firefighters over, there's no one to put, nowhere to put them. Got you. Wow. Every vehicle's full of firefighters. They're all they're already working, right? They they mm -hmm. already have um, something they're doing, and um, they don't really need more firefighters. It's kind of the same over here. Like, even if I had a really large need and they're willing to send their firefighters to help us out, uh, there's a problem with how would we even use them? I don't have a vehicle for them to drive. I don't have a way to get them out there to help out mm -hmm. to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, pretty much for every vehicle we have, we we have someone in those seats, right? Gotcha. Um, we have Need more, more trucks. Yeah. You know, you know, the, the spare capacity is not there. You know, when you talk about like California, Oregon, all these other locations, <clears throat> they're not just sending people. They're, mm -hmm. they're definitely sending a truck and that truck is full of people inside of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so they'll drive up to the major fire and they'll report to the scene. Um, that's the one thing in Hawaii that we just don't have the ability to do, you know, like they can't just jump on the truck and drive over the bridge and get to Maui. Um, doesn't quite work that way. Uh, mm -hmm. And so pretty much they can fly over, but the ability to jump in and interface is difficult, um, yeah. you know? So at, at this time uh, we're looking to integrate a little bit more with them, but um, initially most of the, Big work was being done by um, FEMA level national teams that are coming in with 700 people to do, you know, search and rescue, to comb through the, the wreckages and then um, to search for bodies and, um, yeah. you know, deal with those issues. And so um, those are slowly being demobilized. And, and recently we're just looking at some 
uh, sign up sheets for sending our incident management personnel over to serve uh, in Maui. And I'll be going over there uh, this weekend to spend some time and see how we can best help. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for keeping this island safe during that very exciting time. Um, and everything that you guys do and the volunteers do. It's really great to learn about all of that. Um, and uh, yeah, and for those of us who are fire unwise, we'll have to look into that fire wise program. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That was nice. <laughs> thank you so much because what you added you know like for example you, when you talk about the volunteer i had no idea i thought everybody had just the same amount or it was just a normal thing but mm -hmm. uh what you guys do is pretty impressive i've got to say thank you no i appreciate it uh, awesome yeah. and as, oh sorry go ahead i was gonna say yeah just um when you when you see a firefighter out there in our, our uniform uh, we thank them for their service they yep. they work really hard and um you know i uh I have some pretty amazing people, men, women, you know, like they, they're, they're there, they're committed and they do an amazing job. Awesome. Any uh, other big things you'd want us to know before we uh, sign off, Chief Todd? No, I, I appreciate you bringing me on and um, hopefully I was able to answer your questions and give you a little bit more information about the fire service. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you again, Fire Chief Todd, for joining us. And thank you to you, our viewers, for watching. Uh, if you want to get on our email advisories to see a complete listing of all of the shows, you can sign up for them at thinktechhawaii.com. But we will be back in about two weeks. So please tune in to do a deep dive into our G invention. Until then, I'm Brittany Zimmerman.